Welcome back everyone. I just looked at the calendar today and I happened to notice it was March 20th, 2024. And um, exactly 34 years ago today, my father came home from work in his little powder blue Volkswagen rabbit diesel and um, started carrying in some boxes. Uh, that they were white boxes with gray lettering. Pandy 1000 HX. I was a five year old kindergartner. And um, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Because from that day forward, we were the first household in our neighborhood to own a computer. It was a monumental occasion. And my father was beaming with pride at his new purchase because he knew that he purchased something that would help his only child at the time succeed in school. At least that was the intention. My dad grew up with very, very humble beginnings. He didn't really have much of anything as a kid. Um, he practically raised his four sisters um, from a very young age, um, and um, he wanted better. You know, he wanted better for himself. He wanted better for his family, and he was a, uh, at the time, he was an auto mechanic at a local Nissan dealer. And my mom uh, she worked at McDonald's, and they were both in their early 20s, or mid-20s at the time. My mom would have been 25, my dad 27. They were just two young kids trying their best to raise a, to raise a son. And um, we, um, <clears throat> well, my parents made the decision to, to buy a computer because they felt that it would help me with my education. And my mom just loved Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy and all of those popular um, computer games at the time. And my dad, he wanted to, you know, dabble and learn a few things uh, himself. Um, right here, I have the original sales slip and the original service contract that my dad paid for. The machine came from the... Radio Shack Computer Center, uh, which was, so Radio Shack, um, they had special stores. They were a little bit larger, and they had a larger selection of computer hardware, peripherals, and other things, software. And, um, and they were called the Radio Shack Computer Centers. <clears throat> it was a few years later, I believe, or right around that time that Radio Shack started opening their own computer superstores called Computer City. And if you're from the Nashua area, Nashua, New Hampshire, um, so this Radio Shack store, the computer center, was where the Nashua Mall used to be, which is now right off Route 3. Exit, is it Exit 6? I think it's Exit 6. Um, there was a Christmas tree shop there, um, the mall, it was in, it was a, one time it was a, an indoor mall. It was when I was younger. And um, where the current Home Depot is located, there was a separate strip mall. And that's where the Radio Shack store used to be. When they tore that down and built Home Depot, Radio Shack built a, sec, or a replacement location in its own building. Which is now, um, I think that's been torn down, if I'm not mistaken. Um... And, since we're on the subject, Computer City is where Best Buy currently sits in South Nashua on uh, Daniel Webster Highway. So, on March 30th of 1990, my dad purchased at uh, 3.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, my dad purchased a CM5 color monitor, Tandy 1000, uh, the monitor was $299.96, the Tandy 1000 HX was $299 even. 
he bought a copy of Speller B, which is a game by First Bite. That uh, the DOS version seems to be elusive and very hard to find, and I will find it. I promise you that. Um, that is a game that I actually the only copy we had was destroyed um, shortly after we got this computer. I don't know what happened to it, but it no longer functioned. <laughs> We got a package of three three and a half inch diskettes for six dollars and seventy nine cents. Oh, by the way, Speller B was thirty four ninety five. A six outlet surge protector for twenty nine ninety five. A warranty or TSP plan on the monitor for twenty two fifty, and a TSP on the computer for twenty nine twenty five. This is where I I have to sigh because. Not only did my dad buy the service plan, but it never got used. But it should have been. Um, because shortly after we bought the machine, the monitor would require, you would have to fiddle with the VGA cable in the back um, because it would constantly flake out and you'd get random colors and patterns everywhere. It was really unfortunate. And... Um, I guess, you know, life just got too busy. I don't know what happened, but it never got fixed. Um, and for years, I thought the monitor was defective, but it wasn't. It turned out in 2000, right around 2014 or so, I took the machine apart and realized it was actually the VGA header had a broken solder joint that I was able to easily repair. But... Um, for years, it had this problem, and we never really got it fixed. We could have under warranty, but it just never got done. Um, before we continue on, you'll notice that there is no CM5 monitor. Um, those of you eagle-eyed viewers, Westlife, Retrotech Chris, um, you might notice that we have a CM11 monitor. And I'll tell you why before we continue on, because I know you're dying to know why the monitor was upgraded. Um, sometime in the mid-2010s, um, I acquired a Tandy 1000 TX. Now, by this point, I'm on my own. I'm in my own house. I owned a condo at the time. And um, I started collecting my collecting computers again, really getting involved. The Tandy 1000 TX came without a monitor, and the CM5 that was just sitting at the bottom of my, of my closet filled the job just fine. Um, I ended up selling the 1000TX, and at that time, you've got to understand, the only reason I held on to this Tandy 1000HX is because it was my first computer. I had no plans to do anything with it at all. I was just keeping it for sentimental reasons. It was the least capable machine I had ever owned in my life. Um, and I just figured, what the hell, I'll just let the monitor go with the TX and... If I ever decide to get nostalgic again, CGA monitors can't be that hard to find, you know. They weren't back then anyway, so I just figured, what the hell, I'll just let it go. No big deal. Um, and right around 2019, 2000, was it 19 or 18? 2018, I believe. Um, the, I got that nostalgic itch to dig out the Tandy again. And um, I needed, I'm not going to, I'll expand more on this later in the video, but I needed a monitor. <clears throat> and I just did a quick search in Facebook Marketplace and I found a local seller with a, 1, 000, uh, a CM11, which is the premium display, by the way, for this series of machine. My dad could have easily bought one had, you know, had he been willing to spend the extra money, but obviously it doesn't matter at this point. Um, but the CM11 was the premium display option, and um, the guy wanted $50 for it, and I said, you know what, um, shut up and take my money, because I know what these are worth, <laughs> and, uh, and I bought it. I had to drive all the way to um, central Massachusetts to pick it up, but it was well worth the road trip. So let's get back to the story as it unfolds. I remember the day we got this machine. My dad unboxed it. Uh, my mom was at work. She she worked during the night during the night shift. My dad was a day shift uh, worker, 
and um, one of his friends had come over to help, and, and, and it was an exciting thing, you know, when you bought a, com so when you buy a computer in 2024, nobody gives a fuck, but in 1990, you buy a computer, and you bring it, you know, everybody wants to know, everyone, everyone has questions, everyone wants to see it, everyone wants to pet the new computer, it's like, because it was a, it was as if, like, you know, it's, it's like, just think about it this way, it's 1948, and, you know, you just bought yourself a television set. Most of your friends and family had never even seen a television before. It's like a magical, a magical thing that space age technology from Mars. I mean, nobody really understands it. But, you know, they're afraid of it at first and they don't, you know, it's like that um, Odyssey 2001, you know, when the, when the monkeys are looking at this giant obelisk object or, um, monolith sorry <laughs> monolith they're staring at it like it's like it just came in from outer space so everyone wanted to see this thing and see what it could do because computers were a new a new concept uh to the average person the only people who really had access to computers in the late 80s were the jet sets and complete utter nerds and uh some office workers so it was kind of a kind of a wild idea to have one in your house you know um there was this myth that computers would 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 cause your electric bill to skyrocket to untold numbers you know your bill might actually cost 50 dollars a month oh my god that's a lot of money uh you know they were afraid that if you press the wrong keys i remember watching this as a child and, and seeing adults completely in awe over the power of the of the home computer they just didn't understand what it did what it can't do what it can do and most importantly um how to operate it you know so my dad studied the manual for hours you know just learning basic dos commands and he really didn't get too involved because he, he i don't i don't think i think he lost interest pretty quickly when he realized how much money it was going to cost to take this machine, which he had just bought, and make it more pro more productive, you know. Because remember, what you basically see, well, this and this was all he bought. So we didn't have a mouse, a joystick, a printer. It had its base configuration of 256 kilobytes of RAM, no expansion cards, and being a Tandy 1000HX, there was no fixed disk option available um, at the time. And I believe the in, in earlier years, Radio Shack had um, released an external hard drive that could be used with the 1000HX-EX um, series. But that was not available in 1990. Um, Radio Shack actually phased out the HX entirely that year. Um, so they were already pulling back on the expandability and, 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 um, and peripherals in favor of obviously, you know, the, the more powerful models that uh, they were pushing, you know, 286 class machines and above. Buying an XT class PC in 1990 was still a thing, but they just didn't have the support. It would be like buying a, um... Think of it like buying like a a Core 2 Duo in 2024. A really nice Core 2 Duo. Really, you know, not the I mean, yeah, you can you can do your taxes on it, but you're not going to have a lot of fun on that Core 2 Duo. Maybe that's a little bit of a stretch. The computers haven't really changed as much in the past 10, 15 years as they had between 1984 and to, uh, 1990. So in that, in that six year period, we went from 8088, you know, basic little to no graphics capabilities, um, you know, 256 kilobytes and sometimes even less um, of, of memory, um, five and a quarter inch floppy disks that could only store 360K if it was the double sided variety. No fixed disk of any kind to 
the 286s to the 386s, and now the 486s are out. And Pentiums are three years away. A lot was changing, and we went from a, a, a simply a, a text-only uh, interface to a graphical interface with the introduction of Windows. Windows 3.0 is the one that I, I, I actually count. I don't count Windows 2.0, but Windows 3.0 hit the scene, and then suddenly graphical interfaces were taken seriously for the first time in the PC world. A lot had changed, and then the internet was becoming more and more of a, um, not the internet that we know of today, but the earlier days of the internet was becoming more and more of a, um, a feature that was desirable. So modems, um, and most certainly printers had changed quite a bit in those six years. But my parents didn't have the funds or the budget to expand this machine really beyond its default configuration. Buying software, we, we couldn't, when we, when, when I remember when we were looking at buying additional software for this machine, my mom and I would go to like Bradley's or, um, you know, Kmart and, or other stores. Even we'd go, we'd even go to the mall and go to the, um, you know, like Babbage's. Was it Babbage's or was it? What did we have in our area? It was um, before it was Fye. It was it had to have been Babbage's, and most of the software titles that we wanted to buy would never run on this machine. I remember my mom; she gave me the so we get the Scholastic Book Fair catalogs and um, every year. I was in, of course, I was in school. And I remember in like 1991, my mom um, said, okay, let's buy some software for our computer. And, and there were some software titles available. The only piece of software that was available that would run on this machine was a game called Pipeline. And guess what? That's why I got a copy of Pipeline. But the support network for the 8088 XT PC class machines was waning. And we were still making payments on this thing. My dad bought it with a credit card. His credit card, by the way, I believe it was a MasterCard, account number M77381603767355. Um, was charged a total of 72239. And his signature hasn't changed at all. Oh my god. Um Authorization number 020412. The expiration date's missing, though. Anyway. Try to use that number, I dare you. Um, 34-year-old credit card number. Yes, back 34 years ago, they would print your credit card on the receipt. The card number was actually on the receipt. Um, and in even more low-tech stores, they were still using card impression machines. It's just a little flatbed slider thing that would impress the date I think an authorization number or a unique transaction number and it would also impress the card number right on the receipt it's a pretty neat little anyway if you know you know so we really didn't by the time we were in a position to where we could expand this machine um and it was bad timing my friends because Within uh, one year of owning this computer, my sister was born. Like, just over a year ago. Uh, over a year later. And now with a new infant in the house, um, you know, the family budget was further tightened. And, yeah, it was not fun. And then, you know, a couple of years later, my dad was laid off and had to switch careers. It was not a fun time, you know. So this Tandy 1000, it never really got to live to its fullest potential. It never got to really do what it could... It was never able to be all that it could be. It did not join the computer army, unfortunately. Um, so here it lied, collecting dust in our living room for a couple of years. Um, we were one of those families, by the way, we didn't have a separate office or a special place in the house for the family computer. We had, um, it was actually sitting on 
a wall unit type shelving unit. Um, one of them had our TV and stereo. The other one had the computer on it. And we'd have to pull a uh, kitchen chair up to it to play like Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> we were one of those households. Um, I think at one time we had a computer chair. Let's go ahead and fire it up. So 34 years, it's still going strong. And my sister, who was born shortly after we got this, she's now a mother of two um, adorable children. Um, she's, uh, she's working in the nursing field, which is doing pretty well. Um, but it's, it's time for the Tandy to, to kind of get to stretch its legs, you know? So, as most of you know, I've been collecting computers on and off for over 25 years. And, um, probably longer than that. I started in 1998, so you do the math. Um, the Tandy 1000 was one of those machines that I could never really do much with. I lost interest in it very quickly, and I ended up putting all of my attention into an IBM XT clone that I could just plug in any parallel dot matrix printer into and print my, um, my, my schoolwork. Because prior to that, even though we had a computer in the house, I used a uh, word processor, um, a Smith Corona word processor that technically belonged to my mom um, because we couldn't afford a printer. And any of the printers that my neighbor, the junk man, would bring home from the dump, because that's where he worked, um, they were traditional parallel printers. And for those of you who know, the Tandy 1000 requires a special uh, cable. It's a card edge connector type. And um, which I'm pretty sure is pin compatible with parallel interfaces. I don't think it's serial, but either way. You know, we, I wasn't going to go to Radio Shack to buy a printer cable that I didn't know would work for money I, with money I didn't have. I was, you know, 12 years old. And my parents, you know, they were busy with their problems, so. But this machine, um, like I said, it just didn't get any use. And what ended up happening was I acquired an XT clone from my neighbor, um... The junk man. I call him John the Junk Man. That's what he is. Good guy. Still talk to him to this very day, even though I've we both moved on. <laughs> I think he's in his seventies now. Not important to the story, but um I um I ended up giving him this machine. So he gave me an IBM XT clone, and that was the machine that I ended up learning DOS on with the help of another neighbor an old retired Navy vet. And uh, that's how I learned DOS. He would, I'd talk to him over the phone, even though we lived right next door to each other. And he would tell me what to type. I'd take notes. Um, he gave me a couple of books to cross-reference, which I still have to this day. And that's how I learned. And um, the reason I, I, I poured my heart and soul into the XT clone is because it had a hard disk drive. And with a hard disk drive, I could install software like WordPerfect. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. I thought you just said you need a hard drive to run WordPerfect, and there is no hard drive ever released for the Tandy 1000, so what kind of voodoo wizardry magic do you have working here? We'll talk about that later. But for now, that's not important. Word Perfect was what I needed to be able to write all of my schoolwork and print it out and save it for later editing and reuse. So, here we are. It's probably 1995 or so. What am I doing? Oh, I'm already there. <laughs> Dumbass. All I've got is an XT clone couple of old DOS games, and I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm doing fine. My neighbor was going to uh, learn how to use a computer, and this was his first computer, technically. And um, I didn't really think anything of it. You know, to me, it wasn't really, I wasn't really nostalgic for this machine yet, because it was my first computer. I didn't care. I couldn't do anything with it. Um, software was hard to come by. Software that would not only 
run on a 720K floppy, but also would run with no memory, um, an Intel 8088 processor, and the weird, funky, quite not fully compatible with, with uh, DOS. Um, um, so let's, let's take a quick step back. The Tandy 1000 series was never 100% PC or DOS compatible. Just side note. But what the Tandy 1000 gave you was better graphics. Let me give you a, let me give you an example of that. Um, okay. So you got just slightly better graphics out of a Tandy than you ever could out of an IBM PC, at least with, with a CGA interface and, mo and monitor. So let me give you an example of this. Um, so there's a game that I used to play on my IBM PC clone, not this one, that I would, I would spend hours playing this game. It was a basic, um, kind of like a Sega Outrun type um, driving simulator, if you will. Um, and what you see here is the CGA color palette, okay? Now, I'm going to play the game in CGA first. And you're going to see what I mean. Oh, I already typed. Okay. So the graphics, you know, you get your, this is your, your, your very low, very poor um, CGA. What did I do here? Yeah, so you, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I want that one. And I press plus. Oh, maybe I have to use that. There we go. I think finished. So you get very poor color depth. Um... You know, you get graininess, you get the, the vertical lines. Here, let me give you a close-up shot here. This is what CGA looks like, okay? It's not great, very heavy on the fuchsia, very heavy on the teal. It was the 80s. Now, this particular game does not have an exit. You can't exit this game. You have to shut the machine up. So let's do that. Now I'm going to show you what the Tandy graphics look like. And that's that was one of the selling points that the Radio Shack salesman would use in the store. And I'm pretty sure my dad got that pitch as well. Oh, the Tandy 1000 has better graphics than the leading XT class whatever. Um, at half the price. Uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. So you get the CGA splash screen. Now watch this. We'll select Tandy graphics mode. Watch and learn. Look at that. You already got a sneak, pre a sneak preview of this. Look at this. Look at this. This is so gorgeous. This is what I'm talking about. This is your Tandy 1000 advantage. You also get better sound. Slightly better sound um, capabilities. Now, the Tandy 1000 is not a true IBM clone. I did say it was not an IBM XT, 100% IBM XT compatible. It is not. It is a clone of the IBM PC Junior, which is was geared primarily towards consumer usage. And... As such, there are differences. I don't have them memorized, but you can look it up. IBM PC Junior versus XT or PC, and you'll see what I mean. Um, but look at that. Look at how nice that is. Look at how hot, how amazing the sound quality is from that built-in PC speaker. Anyway. So, what was the point of that demonstration? Yeah. So you can clearly see that this machine um, has some capabilities. And it would have run a lot of the software that I really wanted it to run had I known what I know now. Um, and had I had a few bucks to spend on a few, uh, a few upgrades. For example, the RAM expansion card, which is a proprietary card. Um, so 
So you can add up to three of the optional Radio Shack I, or Tandy expansion boards. There would have been a RAM expansion. There would have been, I believe, a, a parallel connector, like a, a full 25 pin. There would have been a serial interface. Uh, there was a modem available for these. And they would stack vertically in the expansion bay, um, or they connected to a riser card. I forget which one. Now, the riser card, or the, the expansion bus connector itself, is a full 8 bit expansion bus, as I understand it, pin compatible with really any 8 bit expansion card. Um, the problem was the form factor. Because of the slim, uh, case design. It's a very, it's a very small case. Um, you can see the, de it's not very deep. Very small little thing. Um, but because of all of the uh, form factor restrictions, um, Radio Shack Tandy um, did not give you a full 8-bit expansion bus to do with what you please. And they did not give you a separate, you know, section of the board for adding RAM chips or anything like that you would typically find on a PC or even an XT board. But instead, they made it very consumer-oriented, very consumer-friendly, um, which also means difficult to expand. I said before, there was no internal hard drive option. You could have two floppy drives, which would have been a nice upgrade, by the way. Or you could have added one of the optional external five and a quarter inch floppy drives. That was an option you could have with the the HX. Now, the um, the EX model, the earlier version of this, had a uh, five and a quarter inch drive mounted on the side here, and nothing here. Um, it was just a smooth face. It looked a lot like the um, the color computer, if I'm not mistaken. So that all out of the way. I gave the computer to my neighbor. He used it a couple of times over the couple of years he had it, and I had moved on. I'd moved on at home. I had um, I went from the the PCXT to an IBM um, PS2 model 3286 to that Tandy uh, Toshiba 31 T3200 SX. From the T3200SX, I went to a 486, all in the span of like two years. I went from one machine to the next. From the 486, I went to a Pentium 166. From the Pentium 166, I went to a Pentium 133. Long story. Um, and then I went to a Pentium 3, and eventually, you know, I graduated high school. I went out on my own. Now I'm in the Pentium 4s. Then I went with, you know. We all progress in life, and I just happen to remember every computer that I've ever used as a main system. <laughs> Not to get too far off the off the tracks here. The Tandy 1000, um, I didn't get it back into my possession. Because it, it almost was, it was almost lost forever. Um, the monitor and the system unit would have been lost forever. Had I not reached out to my buddy John and said, hey, do you still have my old Tandy? And by this point, we're talking it, I was in my, I think I was in my condo at the, at that time. And uh, I'm like, I'd really like to get my computer back. You know, I wonder how it's doing. So I reached out to my buddy, John, and he said, oh, yeah, you can have it back. I'm like, all right, sounds like a plan. So I went over to his house. I, I loaded up the Tandy, brought it home. And sure enough, the monitor was all flipping out. Remember, it had a defect from day one. Well, it still had the defect. It was still sad and unusable as it ever was, as sad and unusable as it ever was. But at least it was in my possession again. And it was from that point I realized, yeah, this thing kind of sucks. So the monitor got sold off. I kept the system unit. I kept the receipt. I still had all my original software, too. And um, it just sat at the bottom of my closet for 12 years. This thing just sat at the bottom of a closet for 12 years. Moved to this house. Back to the closet it goes. I'm, I'm required to keep it, I guess, you know. Um, but it wasn't until 2019 I found a replacement mod. Not only did I find a, a replacement monitor, but I found a better one in better condition than the one I had. Um, and I reached out to some folks uh, like Retro Tech Chris um, and Rob Krenicki. 
Um, and um, his name is Dylan. I can't remember his, his last name, but the gentleman who created the Smartwatch Plus. So Rob Krenicki developed the three-in-one expansion board, which takes the f three very common, very popular expansion options and combines them into one board. It was a custom laid out, custom printed board uh, with a custom back plane. And um, you either build it from a kit or he would sell you a finished board. I bought mine um, when he was winding down his operation. So I got just the boards, bare boards, and a parts list, which I had to uh, go to Mauser and, and buy everything. So I was able to build the board. Now, what it gives me is a RAM expansion. So we bump it from 256 to 640 kilobytes. We've got a, an RS-232C port, serial port. Um, so I could expand Machines Horizons by getting it on the internet using um, a, win, uh, a Wi Fi modem, which I've done. And it works okay. Um, it also gives you, and clearly there's, I'm, st I'm not pumping in discs, so where's all this stuff coming from? Well, it also gives you a CF card uh, slot, so you can create a, essentially a, a hard disk drive, like a solid state hard disk drive. Um, so for the first time ever, this thing has how much space? Yeah, 256 megabytes of space. That's crazy. For an XT class machine, that is absolutely insane to have that much space. You could never fill it if you tried. 256 megabytes. Oh my God. So we've really given this machine the best possible retirement gift it could ever have. A whole new lease on life. And I didn't stop there. Remember that printer that I didn't get when I was in kindergarten? Well, there it is. I went and I found myself a, a, a DMP-133, which is made by, I, I believe, Shinetsu. Not Shinetsu. It's um, Seikoshi. It's a Seikoshi. That's who makes this. Japanese uh, printer manufacturer. It's a black and white dot matrix nine pin printer. It's all it ever needed. We have one. Got the correct cable for it. I've got a joystick. And now that I have a mouse, um, excuse me, and uh, a serial port, I can add any serial mouse I want, even a wireless one. Um, so let's take a look at, um, uh, let's see, under desk. Let's take a look at Tandy Personal Deskmate 2. This is the software that we had on this machine. This was really the only thing we had for it. Notice how it's keeping time, March 2024. Well, that's because of the Smartwatch Plus, um, which you can find on, um, on Tindy. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. The Smartwatch Plus is a module that sits between your ROM chip, I believe. Is it the ROM chip? Or the ROM, yeah, the BIOS ROM chip and the logic board, and it gives you a real-time clock with a battery backup. Um, and it is working. It's keeping, date, it's keeping the date and time just fine. March 20th. Uh, it is an hour off because daylight savings. I need to fix that. It's 11.39. Oh, shit, it's getting late. Um, but desk... Excuse me, Deskmate has a text, a basic, basic text editor. There's a couple of sample documents in here. Here's a sample um, resume for a guy named John Doe. Um, very basic, very basic. Um, but check out these graphics, guys. I mean, this is really quite decent. Um, normally, Deskmate runs off a of floppy disk. Um, but because we have technology that didn't really exist in 1990 um, we have more than that you know it has a built-in music player and you can actually hear some of the superior sound capabilities let's go ahead and play this sample song here you can't do that with an XT just can't be done. 
so you can actually change the songs if you want. You can just uh, you can just edit them at your will at your whim. Um, I can just add some random shit to it. Oh, I, have to, I think I have to insert. What did I just do? You have to know what you're doing too. Oh, here we go. <coughs> or we could just make something from scratch. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it drag and drop? I forget. I've done this before. Uh... Oh, there we go. And you just press the corresponding number key and place it where you want. for my compositions, but you get the idea. Um, and it has, of course, one of my favorite uh, painting tools. This is me trying to draw a smiley face. <coughs> Not a very good one. Here, let's change the view. Let's do this. I can just erase it. There we go. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. You're going to hear a few sounds from this Tandy. Um, this is for folks who didn't own these when they were new. And you might be, maybe you found one in, in an attic somewhere. Maybe you bought it at a garage sale. Maybe you bought it on eBay for $800. You bring it home, you turn it on, and you hear that constant drone of a cooling fan noise. That is 100% normal. They left the factory this way. I know this because I owned this thing when it was new. 34 years ago. The other thing you're going to hear, if I turn the speakers up a little bit, you can hear it a little better. You're going to hear some noises coming from the speaker um, as it's processing data. That is also normal. It does not indicate a hardware fault of any kind. That is how they sounded when they were brand new. In fact, I thought it was a little odd, but I didn't really know anything different. I just didn't know any better. That's just how it sounded. So we're going to... Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So there's our circle. That's supposed to be orange, by the way. I'm going to fill in my circle. Now, remember how I said we didn't have a mouse growing up? I had to do all of this with arrow keys. Seriously. Arrow keys. That's how I drew with arrow keys. It was not fun. Kids today will never know the struggle of having to draw, make artwork on your family's computer with arrow keys. They will never know. They will never know. With iPads. I, I, I see kids today bitching about touch screens. Kid, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't. You don't know. You don't know, friend. Um, yeah. Am I right? Damn. Damn Gen Zs. But they literally will never know unless they dig up a Tandy 1000 that they found in Grandma's, you know, attic. They'll never know. 
And uh, it's up to us, folk, to teach them right. Now, it's unfortunate that I can't change the color of the line tool from this viewpoint. See? I can't change the color of the line tool. Which is really sad and depressing. I have to exit the tool and go into here to change the color. I feel shafted, my friends. I feel like I've been wronged by whoever designed this software because it's just a pain in the neck to use. <laughs> Make some random geometric shapes. This is what I did. When I was a kid, I would do this for hours. That's all I really used this computer for was to make drawings. And not very good ones because, remember, no mouse. You know, all arrow keys. Um, because there's a mouse connected and it sees that, it won't let me. It won't let me use the arrows to control the cursor. So but that's my box. You like my box? I made that box. So this computer spent its entire life without a mouse, without word processing software, no printer, no joystick, none of that. But here we are, 2024, 34 years after it came home in my dad's Volkswagen diesel rabbit hooked up to a mouse. I've got it on I've got it on the internet already once or twice or a little more than that. And um, I've been having more fun with this machine in the in the in the more recent years than I ever had with this thing before. Now see the paint bucket. Now the paint bucket paint bucket we have the ability to change colors with the click of a button look at that isn't that cool isn't that grand i don't know what we're doing here with this with this color box i'm just having fun and i love these patterns this is something that um, I believe Apple Paint had, or Mac Paint. You had different uh, colors and options and things. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? There we go. Now, one little thing I'll, I'll share with you guys from my childhood. When I, so when most kids draw things, I believe they're drawing them from the viewpoint of standing outside of that object. When I was a kid, if I drew a house, for example, it would be a cutaway view of a house, not the actual house, or what I imagined a house would look like from the cutaway view. When I drew cars, they were cutaway views. I never properly drew a car from the outside perspective. So when I was about five years old, one of the first things I did on this very machine was I drew a house. It was a cutaway of a house. It was floors, doors, window, like areas where there would have been, you know, fixtures. Stairs. It had stair uh, staircase. And that drawing was saved to the master copy of art. Well, we called it, called it art paint, but um, <clears throat> it was saved to the master copy of, um, of Tandy's Deskmate software. And for, I want to say for 20 to 30 years, no, 20, 20 years, for 20 years, that disc remained readable and I could still see that original drawing and I thought it was the coolest thing. The disc went bad and I never thought to make a backup of it. It was a shame. It was lost forever, but it was one of my classic cutaway drawings and none of, very few of those still exist. I found a couple, actually. My, my parents saved a few of them, but that's how I drew. I wouldn't draw a car. I would draw a cutaway of a car. You could see the dash, the people inside. I didn't know any better. That's just how I did it. Um. So there we go. That's the Tandy 1000 on its 34th birthday, and I wanted to share it with you guys because I know you guys, some of you folks love this stuff. Um... I did one additional upgrade aside from Rob. So Rob Krenicky, by the way, he, he I believe he has brought back 
production of his uh, Tandy 3-in-1 cards. And I'm going to try to find links, and I'm going to put them in the description of this video. I'm also going to put a link for the Tandy 1000 smartwatch by, uh, by Derek of Cybernetic Systems out of Australia. Um, because I really think it's a great product, and it actually... And he's even using my video on his website. Check it out. That's my install video on his website. Kind of cool. Um, there was one additional upgrade that I gave this machine, and that was a processor upgrade. It was a very popular upgrade for IBM XT and PC and clone owners back in the day. And that was the NEC V20 processor upgrade. It's a slightly faster pin compatible um, 8088 replacement. And um, it does give the machine a little bit of a boost. Just a slight boost. Not You're not going to notice it too much, but I have noticed a slight bump in performance. Um, it's just a more efficient processor, I guess. I don't know. But it was a quick and very inexpensive upgrade. Why not do it? I still have the original processor. It's actually tucked away inside the case somewhere. But um, anyway, folks, uh, that's pretty much all we have here for the 1000. And um, I will say, you know, it, it is my... Now that I have it back in my life, um, and it's one of the only possessions I have from my young childhood days, it is a prized possession for me. It is the machine that, you know, if Amelia and I agree that we need to free up some space and I have to get rid of my computer collection, whether it be something that she coaxes me to do, not that she would ever do that, or if I just decide, you know what, classic computers are for, for they're just not for me anymore. Um, I would happily sell off everything except this one. This is the only machine I would keep. Um, it will never be sold as long as... I am above ground. It will never be sold. Um, it will never be given away. I never, it's, it's just not leaving my possession. Um, I've seen the value of these machines actually kind of skyrocket. And that has spurred some of the interest in some of the uh, expansion and modification um, uh, products that are available for this machine. And um, so there's a renewed interest in some of these early home computers. Um, it's, you know, every you know, the, the Commodore had its moment in the sun. It actually still is currently riding that wave to the point where the X16 is now a thing, which is kind of neat. Um, but, but, but once again, I mean, you know, this Tandy 1000... Um, it was kind of the black sheep of my collection, but I could never get myself to really get rid of it once I got it back in the fold. And um, I even made this custom monitor stand. Let's talk about that for a moment before we go. When you bought the Tandy 1000 HX, you know, Radio Shack really, I think they deliberately designed this machine so you would have to buy either a monitor swivel stand or a monitor stand that would sit over top the machine. And those are very hard to come by, if not impossible. It's almost as if they knew what they were doing. If they had made the case just a wee bit deeper, they could have designed it so that the monitor could sit on top, just as it did for the Apple IIe. But no, that would be, you know, reducing our ability to sell accessories. Um, so they designed it in such a way that you can't sit a monitor on top of it. And it's really awkward um, to just to set it up on a desk without all those extra accessories. But I decided, you know what, I'm not going to pay. I think I found one for like 200 bucks or something. I'm like, I'm not going to pay that. I built this beautiful oak monitor stand that I'm quite proud of. It's the perfect monitor stand for this. It looks the part. It plays the part well it really does even matches my um i have an oak disc file that i bought for it i think i found it at savers that matches and it has all of my tandy 1000 software in it all the special custom formatted 720k diskettes are all in this little box 
and it matches my my oak monitor. It's solid oak, it's solid oak, and nothing but the best. Nothing but the best for my baby. Um, yeah, and this just kind of can sit right next to it or whatever, you know. Um, but there's no room to be in right now. So. Oops. But anyway, happy 34th birthday, Tandy 1000. Um, probably should have waited until next year when it's 35, but uh, that would be um, that would be no fun.